Hey everyone, in this episode we're going to create our first entity from scratch and dive into ECS syntax. I know you're all raring to go, but we're going to take baby steps. We will just create a simple object and get acclimated to this very different way of working. There's a whole new UI to learn and an entirely new methodology. Remember that Unity Dots is a number of things. ECS, the job system, and the burst compiler. Let's take them one at a time, and we'll start with ECS, which is quite a large topic by itself. ECS stands for Entity Component System, and we're going to start with entities. Before we can do anything, we'll need to set up our project for dots, make a fresh Unity project. You'll need to use Unity 2019.3 or later. And I'll make this a basic 3D project where you can choose one of the SRP templates as well, but that's up to you. In the window package manager, you will absolutely need two packages, the entities package and the hybrid renderer package. Once those are installed, we can start with a mono behavior script. This will serve as a bridge between working in quote unquote classic style and the new data oriented style. I'll call this spawner since that's what I'm going to use to spawn our entity. And let's stay organized with a scripts folder. Inside of our mono behavior script, I can gut everything except for the start method. And we'll also need to add an extra using line at the top using Unity entities. This imports the resources that we need for ECS. Now let's create a private make entity method that returns nothing and takes nothing as an argument. And we'll invoke it straight away in start. Before we get too deep into scripting, we should get some terminology straight. In ECS, we'll organize everything as entities, components, and systems. Unlike modern behaviors, where you can mix data and actions or methods, we split them into smaller pieces. Entities are things in your game, components represent data in your game and systems are the logic of your game. Now don't worry about the specific syntax of each one, we'll get to that, but keep this structure in mind. Everything is split into entities, components, and systems. Things, data, logic. And that's probably as simple as I can distill it. Organizationally, there's also a world that includes all of the game systems. And there's also another structure called an entity manager that manages all of your entities or things. We have one entity manager per world. When you need to do something with an entity, create it, assign it data, destroy it, you're always going to do that with the entity manager. In the spawner script, let's create a variable, entity manager, entity manager. To get a reference to the current entity manager, I'll grab that from world, default game object injection world, dot entity manager. I know this is a slightly longish name, but really this just means our current default world. Remember that I mentioned that we have a world holding all the game logic and each world has one entity manager. This static entity manager gets a reference to it. We're always going to use the entity manager to create entities and you'll do that with the create entity method entity manager dot create entity and that should create our first entity. Don't get your hopes up. This is going to be very anticlimactic, but save the script and let's try it. Create a game object to run our script and I'll call that spawner as well. Drop the spawner component in there. Hit play in the editor. And okay, so what gives? Did something happen? Well, it did. We created an entity, but you'd never know it by looking at the hierarchy. Entities don't exist here. To see the results of make entity, you really need to go to the entity debugger. And you'll find that under Windows Analysis Entity Debugger. Whenever you're working with ECS, you'll dock this window somewhere or keep it close, somewhere accessible because you'll refer to it often. If you look at the left column of the entity debugger, you'll see an entry called All Entities Default World. If you click on that, you'll see in the middle column, we have two entities and they're numbered, not named by default. Entity zero is something we get automatically. If you select that, you'll see that it contains our game clock, everything related to time in our game world. In the third column, 
the entity debugger shows you the memory chunk corresponding to entity zero. So this chunk of data has two different data types, the world time and world time Q. The chunk shows you the data types. To see the actual data, you need to look at the inspector. And sure enough, you can see our actual world time and world time Q, and you can see the real time data that is incrementing every frame. Unity created entity zero for us automatically. Entity one is what we created with our script. If you select it, you can see that, well, there it is. The corresponding memory chunk is blank and the inspector is essentially blank as well. An entity by itself is not really meaningful. In ECS, an entity is just a thing that references other pieces of data. Without any data, it's just an ID with nothing to point at. The idea is that a thing in your game, an entity, is just an identifier. The data itself is somewhere else, and that's the important thing, and it's not actually contained within that entity. So let's just think back to working with model behaviors. In what we call, quote unquote, classic Unity, if you create a game object, and let's just do that for argument's sake, whenever you make an empty game object, you get stuff automatically. It contains a whole lot of things by default, a transform, a name, a tag, a layer. Even though these fields might be blank or uninitialized at zero, they always come with a game object. And sometimes that's convenient. But each little piece takes up a small bit of memory. When you have one game object, then fine. But if you start to add hundreds or thousands, then you start noticing the inefficiency. Entities don't have that issue. They're just numbers, integers in fact. Of course, the flip side to this is that you need to assign data to them in order for them to be meaningful. They need to point to other pieces of data. Let's go back to the spawner script and see how we can do that. And I'll preface this by saying that I'm going to show a lot of code here that you won't necessarily need to memorize. I'm writing it out so you can understand the process of what's happening, but there is a shorter syntax for doing the same thing, and we'll take a look at that later. But just humor me for a moment. To assign data to our entity, first let's decide what type of data we want to give it. And we'll do that using what's called an archetype. I'll define an entity archetype, entity archetype, archetype, using the entity manager's create archetype method. And inside of here, we just pass in a bunch of data types. Unlike game objects and mono behaviors, we don't get any transforms or rendering by default in ECS. We need to import separate resources that Unity has built specifically for that purpose. At the top, add a using Unity transforms, using Unity rendering, and using Unity mathematics lines. Once you have those imported, inside of create archetype, pass in type of translation, type of rotation, type of render mesh, type of render bounds, and type of local to world. Translation and rotation give us the ability to move and rotate the entity in world space. The other three types are for rendering the entity on screen. We'll use render mesh to define the mesh and material, Render bounds defines the bounding box. Local to world transforms from local space to world space. These are just types that the hybrid renderer requires to draw the object. Then we need to pass the archetype into the create entity method. And that does some basic setup for our entity. So let's check it out in the entity debugger. Save the script. In Unity, again, nothing shows up in the hierarchy at runtime. It doesn't look any different. But in the entity debugger, we've suddenly added some extra data types to entity one's memory chunk. You can see the archetype in the third column. It contains everything that we specified in the script, plus a couple more data types that the hybrid renderer added automatically. In addition to the render bounds, there's a chunk world render bounds and a world render bounds. The data types aren't in any particular order. I think it's just listing them alphabetically in the UI. An archetype is more like a relational database. Order's not really important. If you check out the inspector, you'll see that it's no longer blank. It has some extra fields that correspond to our archetype. But the fields don't have any values. They're all uninitialized at the moment. To add some data, we'll need to go back to the script. In the spawner, reserve a couple of fields for a mesh and material. And I'll just serialize a couple of private fields unit mesh and unit material. 
that makes them visible in the inspector. One of the benefits of keeping this as a mono behavior. And then down in the make entity method, let's arbitrarily assign a translation value. And we do that with the entity manager, entity manager dot add component data. Remember that the C in ECS stands for component and component really just means data. So add component data will add some data to our entity. We need to specify which entity as the first argument and then pass in the data itself as a second argument. So let's first temporarily store our entity somewhere. Entity my entity equals the results of this. And now in the add component data, let's assign our entity to a world space position. For example, I'll move it to a coordinate at say position 204. My entity is the first argument and then I pass in the XYZ coordinate as the second argument. And that will be through a new translation object. Now inside of the curly braces, we'll set the value to a new float at coordinate 204. You'll see shortly that a translation is just a struct. It has a value member variable that we can set to a specific coordinate. We get this translation from Unity transforms and the float three from Unity mathematics. And that's why we needed to add those using lines earlier. Again, these are things that Unity created for ECS and dots because A, you don't get them for free from amount of behaviors anymore and B, they're much more memory friendly and efficient. Once we do that, we're actually going to move the entity's position in world space, but it won't display properly. To make it visible, we also need to assign a mesh and material. We'll do that with a slightly different method called add shared component data. Entity manager dot add shared component data this time. Again, the entity goes in as the first argument and the data as the second. My entity and then pass in a new render mesh and inside of the render meshes curly braces, set the mesh and material. Whereas translation only had a value field, render mesh has a mesh and material among other things. Mesh equals unit mesh, material equals unit material. And that should connect whatever you have in the inspector to our entity. Save the script. In Unity, I've already imported a material and mesh to populate those fields. In my material subfolder, I have a blue material called cube mat. It's nothing fancy. Just make sure you go down and check enable GPU instancing in your material. And though this is not particular to dots, we will be rendering a lot of these objects later. So having this check means your GPU can help you reduce the number of draw calls in your scene. In the models subfolder, there is a beveled cube model called cube smooth. It's scaled to meters already. Feel free to use one of the default primitive models that already comes with Unity or substitute your own mesh in here. The Blender Monkey, a giant robot, whatever you want. Just make sure that you assign the mesh and material in the spawner. Then in play mode, we now get a blue cube at world space position 204 as we expect. Note that you can't click on the cube in the scene view. There's no way to manipulate an entity like a game object, just like there's no way to see it in the hierarchy, but it is there. And that's just part of working with entities at the moment. There are differences that you'll just need to get used to. You can use the entity debugger to locate specific entities and then check their values in the inspector. For example, you can see that our entity is currently at position 204. All right, so we've created a cube, no big deal. The key takeaway here is that the cube is not a game object, it's an entity. We created some data for a mesh, some data for a material, and some data for a 3D position. Our entity essentially just links these pieces of data together and Unity tells the hybrid renderer to draw it on screen. And that's a whole other process. Realize has to do something special to connect our light and camera which are regular game objects to the ECS world. But essentially that's how we can create an entity and display it on camera. Of course, if you had to do this every time, you might just give up on dots and ECS altogether. There's a lot of boilerplate here just to do something simple. Now don't worry, it gets easier. I just wanted to break this process down so you understand what's happening. First, we get a reference to our world and the entity manager. We define an archetype of data types. 
we create an entity using that archetype, and then you assign specific data values using add component data or add shared component data. In our case, we dropped in a mesh and material from the inspector, and we hard coded a world space position in our script. Feel free to test out different values for the material or mesh or draw the entity at a different point in space. If you're adventurous, you can add a new scale or rotation value if you want to continue exploring how to do this in what we call, quote unquote, pure ECS, where you build the entities completely within code. While it's good to know this syntax and having these in a script gives you a lot of flexibility, it can be a little tedious to set this up each time you want to create an entity. Fortunately, there is a relatively new conversion workflow that simplifies this process. So let's check that out in the next episode.